Hey there and welcome to Concierge Medicine Radio, your source for actionable advice and real stories of physicians running and growing concierge practices. For more interviews and notes on today's show, please visit ConciergeMedicineRadio.com and enter your email. Now, let's join your host, Taylor Pearson. Hey there, welcome to today's episode of Concierge Medicine Radio. We're joined today by Dr. Carrie Bordinko. Dr. Bordinko was voted as one of Phoenix's top doctors of 2014 and the 2014 top doctor in concierge medicine. So thank you for joining us today, Dr. Bordinko. Happy to be here, Taylor. So tell us a little bit about your practice and your practice model. Well, my practice was set up a little different than most concierge models. I went with what we kind of consider a high-touch model and a very low-volume concierge design where I only care for approximately 60 patients where the normal concierge may take on three to 400 patients. So the amount of time I interface with that patient, spend time with them, the length of the visits is longer than the average. Plus, I went completely outside the box and I didn't build an office and I go directly to the patient's home or to their office if that's more convenient for them. And so my experience is right there in the middle of their dining room or living room, which gives me a completely different insight into their medical needs. So walk us through what a typical day looks like for you then. My day varies widely. We cover such a a wide variety of healthcare needs with different consumers, but usually it encompasses seeing three, maybe four on the top side patients a day. So once again, very low volume. The average allotment of time for any patient experience is about two hours. And, you know, in our version of concierge, we actually don't even use the word patient. We call them clients because the one thing that we realize as you go into a more service-focused industry like concierge, that these people are electing to pay you. They're electing to pick you over a different provider. And you have to remember that client is a more positive word because it says that they're selecting you and you're providing a service. But I might see three people a day, I might do a lab draw, I might do an EKG in the home, I might make recommendations about something that's medical, or we might even choose to go for a hike or a grocery experience and look at healthy eating habits. So it's a wider continuum of someone's medical management than what you would traditionally get in a high volume practice in an office. Yeah, as you said, it's very, very high touch. I mean, that's the word that we use, and that's the word that was actually coined by the the clients that I serve. They've kind of helped me develop my model through uh, feedback, through experience. They've put the words out there that tell me as a physician what is important to them. Unfortunately, when we're delivering medical care in the way that we're all raised through our residency experience and our private practice experience, we might see medicine through a different eye than the consumer sees it. So I'm very open to trying gaining feedback from them to say, what is valuable about this experience to you? What keeps you coming back year after year? Because that's really the nature of the business is you don't want to be recruiting patients every year. You want to keep the same patients in your practice year after year. It makes for a nicer experience for the physician and a much nicer experience for the patient because you have that solid renewal going on. But obviously, initially, you did have to recruit people into the practice. So we spoke a little bit about this before, but how did you get started? How did you grow the business when you were first starting out? I think I did what a lot of physicians do. And, you know, I I tried everything that was imaginable from doing mailers to magazine advertisements. But what worked for me, and I think what you find works for most successful concierge practices is actually word of mouth. I don't think that there is anything more powerful than that. I was not a physician who had a large practice of 3,000 patients who chose to downsize and go into concierge. I think that's a very different recruiting model. I build it from one patient up. So for me, solidifying a very positive experience, a very value-based experience for patient number one, two, three, and so on is what allowed me to grow very quickly, exponentially, in a very short amount of time and have a successful retainer practice. Those patients are very happy to be your billboard. They will go out in their peers and their community and say, I have this great, fantastic relationship with my doctor that is priceless. You should try and get on board, too, because it's a limited membership. So that's how I grew it, was word of mouth. 
And I think that for most physicians that you do talk to, even if they downsize, what they find out is keeping people very positive about the experience and delivering value that the patient can measure is how the word of mouth gets out and it's how they actually grow. And did you do anything to facilitate the word of mouth or was it just kind of organic? Once you got the first couple people in the door, it just grew naturally. No, I would say I do facilitate it if you want to go as far to say, do I ask for the referrals? I don't think you should be shy about asking your patients if you're happy with this experience. Please don't hesitate to think of four friends that you can refer me to. I actually still do that because I've just taken on a new partner in the business in the last two months. She's building it up from, you know, zero patients to trying to get to the 60 where I'm at. And so very actively send out information to clients and say, you may have friends that are in the same situation you are. Maybe they're looking at making a transition from a current concierge practice to more of a high touch, or maybe they're leaving the traditional high volume medicine and they're looking for a different experience. We would welcome an opportunity to talk to them about our business model. So I don't think you have to be shy or feel ashamed to ask for that business. Anytime you're providing a service and you know that you're delivering value, it's perfectly acceptable to go and say, I would like to help out other friends of yours as well. And what is it about your service in particular that you think makes it so referable? When people recommend their friends to you or recommend you to their friends, to their circles, what is it that they're saying that's so convincing? Well, I think that's an easy question, and I think it applies across many different types of concierge practices or service industries. First and foremost, anybody who gets into this type of business needs to understand Your goal is obviously to deliver excellent medical care and to take care of your patients and do the things that you couldn't do when you were bound by the time constraints of insurance or having to see 30 people a day. But you have to deliver service and value. When you stop doing that, the whole concept of concierge tends to buckle out from underneath you. So it's not hard to get a referral. It's not hard to get a client telling 10 of their friends, you have to get on board and get in this practice. If the money that they are writing the check for, they feel the term I've I've heard used a lot is you're a cheap date. And what they just mean by that is you could really charge more for what you deliver. Always over deliver and under promise. I mean, that's a great philosophy in any service industry. We see it set by things like Ritz Carlton and Nordstrom's every day. And it has to become part and parcel to what your mantra is as a concierge physician as well. So even if you're at a price point of $2,500 or $5,000 or $10,000 like myself, I don't think it matters. Just deliver the value that equates to the price you've set. Deliver more than that. And people will be very happy to become your billboard for you. I know one of the questions I always ask myself when I'm pricing out services or something is, can I deliver a 10x value on this within the next 12 months? It's usually something where you fail. It's, it's hard to give 10x value, but if you fall short and you only get to 5x, people are usually pretty happy. Totally agree with you. Well, tell us a little more than about, you mentioned some of your pricing structure. You said you have 60 patients. How did the kind of economics of your model work? The economics was built over time. I did not start out at at being at the price point I'm currently at, and and I don't know that anybody could launch with that because I think you have to have some reputation built up to come into the market, you know, five times higher than everybody else in your market. But one thing that I did do is I listened to the consumer nonstop. It's something I can't stress enough to someone doing any type of business development in in concierge or or anywhere in, in an industry is constantly ask for the feedback from the consumer. First off, they love to give it. They, they love to have an opinion and, and feel heard. And you will gain so much more knowledge than you can get that just, you know, by looking at back with the microscope back on your practice yourself. But what I did is I would have patients ask me for very abstract services. They would say, you know, we know you're a doctor. We know you're going to prescribe our high blood pressure meds and you're going to draw our labs and you're going to do a physical. Those are givens. We get that and we appreciate the fact that you open your office extended hours or come to us whenever or answer the phone on a Friday night. Those are givens in concierge. But then they started asking for unique services, such as I'm going to undergo a very life-altering cancer surgery. 
And to do that, I really want to go to a center of excellence such as MD Anderson. What would make me and my spouse feel the most comfortable is if our doctor, who knew every bit about us, went with us. And I said, wow, that's a great concept. I mean, you're right. The communication between providers would be excellent. I would be able to give them real-time information about where you're at. I would be able to help you in the recovery process. But I don't think that's something that you just open up your doors and say, this is what I'm going to do for somebody. It came out of a request. I analyzed what that cost would be to the consumer, and I offered that up as one of my services. So accompanied medical travel is what we call it is an add-on product that anybody in the practice can elect to have. There's many services such as medical bill review. Getting a bill from a hospital for your total knee replacement can be overwhelming to a patient. They get it, Medicare or the insurance pays a certain percentage, and then they're hit with a, a usually a fairly substantial copay. You don't know if that bill was processed correctly or incorrectly. That happens to be a talent that I possess to do coding and billing. So when someone asked me and put a bill in front of me and said, hey, Dr. Bordenko, do you think this is the right amount? Should I really be writing a check for this? I said, let me take a look at it. All of a sudden, I realized that's a value-added service. I can provide that to every patient, and I can incrementally keep increasing my value that I'm delivering, thus increasing my annual retainer fee. So over the years, different things have been added on to that service that I find are regularly requested kind of non-traditional medical tasks that I do, but it just keeps adding value to the consumer. And and so I add those on and, and we perform them. Have you ever heard the term customer development? I have not. Not that terminology. I may have heard of it, but not using coining the phrase. Well, no, it's exactly what you're doing. It's kind of a tech world term. But the idea that instead of uh, going into this back room and creating the perfect product or the perfect service, instead you kind of go out to the market and you talk to the market and see what it is they really want and then you give it to them. Well, I guess that's what we've been doing and, and not really realizing we're doing it. We just look at it within Consolari as being responsive and receptive to the ever-changing request of the patient because the last thing you want to do is is start out or launch out and then stay firmly rooted in what was, you know, the newest, latest, greatest 24 months ago. We're in a very dynamic industry in medicine that changes by the second. And I think the concierge philosophy has to also be that dynamic, that you're constantly looking at what are the value adds you can offer. Well, what is the typical profile for one of your patients now? Uh, My patients are pretty unique. They are... In different locations in the U.S., some are actually international. They all establish with me, of course, in my state of residence, but that doesn't mean that they live here full time. The average person is usually a C-suite executive. Most of them are CEOs. They own large either regional companies or national companies. And they have busy lifestyles. They're active. They feel like they're on the cutting edge of, of everything in their industry. They want to be on the cutting edge of medicine. They want to have exposure to the best physicians, the best centers of excellence in the nation if they have a problem arise. And I would say net worth is, on average, probably close to $20 million. So it's not Bob next door. But that being said, I'm very proud to say that I do have a handful of individuals that are average, every day, working hard, struggling to, you know, figure out where they're going to spend their elective income, and they choose to spend their elective income in my practice. And I'm very flattered by that because I know it's a big chunk of change for them to invest. But they also tell me very loudly that they really, really value the quality that we bring back to them and the security that we bring back to them when it's handling their health care needs. Well, I'd be curious, what do people say that if they've already been working with a concierge physician and they move to working with you, what is it that moves them from a different concierge practice into your practice? Great question. I would say about 90% of my patients had had a prior concierge experience before they moved to my practice. I definitely don't think I'm the first stop into concierge medicine for most people. And oh, it, wow, okay. It, yeah, it's a really great learning curve for all the concierge docs out there, though. What they all say consistently is, 
I wanted a better, closer relationship with a physician. I wanted consistency. I wanted to see the same provider year after year without insurance or the government kind of interfacing and telling me who I was going to see. I did not want to see an extender. And I thought I bought all that when I wrote my check. And I'm disappointed. So I think it's a great learning experience. If you're going to go out into the concierge market, you need to remember to walk away from the high volume ways, which means be very, very cautious about putting extenders out there in front of the patients when they're paying for a service model. Be very careful about limiting your hours and, you know, sending people to the emergency room is my classic example, Friday at four o'clock because you're not going to be available on the weekend is the high volume way of doing it. It really should not be considered the concierge way of doing it. And no matter what your price point, 1500 a year, 2500 a year, or 5000 just remember they're writing a personal check for that. It's not their insurance company paying that premium. So at the end of the day, are they going to look at you and go, I got what I needed, I got what I paid for, I actually got more. And that's why people leave. They feel like even though they're writing a much less expensive check, they didn't get anything different in the experience than they were getting when they gave their Blue Cross Blue Shield card at the desk. Interesting. Could you elaborate on what you mean by uh, extenders? I haven't heard that term before. Okay, yeah. Extenders are what we commonly refer to in the industry as PAs or nurse practitioners. Okay. And that's something that's become very commonplace in many markets that you won't see actually the doctor, you'll see an extender. You may see the doctor for the very first encounter, but then when you call in and say, I have a sore throat or I have a rash, can it be looked at? You're commonly seen by an extender versus an MD or DO. And that's something in the concierge world I think people need to be very aware of because we're starting to see concierge docs consider that also an acceptable way of treating, and people are really retreating from that. The consumer is retreating away from that. And do you see a lot of concierge doctors using extenders or working with extenders? I think the topic is coming up nationally, and I think it's something that's being discussed. We are seeing more direct primary care practices using extenders, and not as much of what I would call a retainer practice, which is what the model that I follow is. But yes, for direct primary care, because they're trying to compete in a cash market and keep the costs down, I think they are looking at the world of extenders and saying, this is a way we can be more viable, charge less. But you have to be very careful because people are partying with their cash to have this experience, and they do know the difference. Well, coming back a bit to your practice specifically, what are the biggest challenges you face operating on a a day-to-day basis? For me, the biggest challenge has been up to having the new partner join, just the limitation of what I could offer as one person who can only talk to one client at a time or be in one place at a time. So not being able to keep up with the demand is probably my biggest personal challenge. Having a new partner come in, I'm hoping that that becomes less and less of a challenge. Actually, I know you'll never hear this in the concierge world, but actually having to turn away business for the last two years and tell people that I am only one person and I just can't take on more business is, a, I guess, a challenge a lot of people would like to have. But for me, it was frustrating because I had some great stories of friends of current clients who said, you know, they really need your help and this would really be important to them and I just wasn't able to be there for them. So personally, I saw that as a challenge. If you want to speak instead of challenges and talk about frustrations, I would say my biggest frustration is when I have to interact with any form of insurance. And I, I don't think that changes just because I'm in a private pay world. So that that's usually my annoyance for the day. I've actually talked to, I won't say a lot, but a fair number of concierge physicians that have had the problem of their practice has grown too big for them to continue accepting patients and are looking for associates. So I'd be curious, how did you find the person that's working with you now? I think this is a great opportunity for someone to grab a hold of and solve for all of us as concierge physicians because it was a struggle for me. I spent two years trying to find someone. It was obviously word of mouth, which is I'm sure what most of us would turn to. And it wasn't very effective. I I don't think we have a good outlet. I don't think we have a place to go to and recruit from either young residents coming out of training programs or people just deciding that they want to get out of the cattle call world of high-volume medicine. 
I don't think we have a, a place to advertise, recruit, and vet and talk to people about that. I'm hoping that will be a changing issue for all of us going forward. I got lucky. I was on a phone call with a specialist doing a surgical follow-up, and he wanted to inquire more about my business. I talked to him, and he said, you won't believe it, but my wife wants to transition over, and we spent six months communicating with each other and feeling out if this was going to be a good working relationship, and it worked out wonderful. But I I got lucky, and that's exactly how I would phrase it. I didn't have a good venue to go and recruit from. And traditional recruiting channels, you just didn't find to be effective? No, because I don't think the traditional recruiting channels had the ability to vet out what I do for a living and understand it. I mean, the traditional recruiting channels in the internal medicine world is hospitalists and and high-volume primary cares. They're not critiquing and and interviewing on the scale that I would, looking for certain personality characteristic traits. You know, are you going to be comfortable getting up from the dinner table three nights a week at 7 p.m. and having to take a phone call from a client, you know, because there is no off hours in the world of concierge if you're doing it in the high-touch world. They didn't have a way of really understanding my marketplace and my unique needs, in in my opinion. If we had a, a form, either a forum or an industry that understood it better and could start to look for those skill sets, that would be, I think it would be a bonus for all of us. Well, speaking to someone that's in that high volume model and wants to move into concierge or thinking about the people you've seen make that transition, what are the most common mistakes you see them making? The most common mistakes are definitely when they transition into the concierge model, they forget that they have to put the service model there also. They tend to keep the same staff. They tend to keep the same patient experience when you walk in the front door. Did you change anything about your waiting room? Did you add beverages and snacks and and make it look a little bit more hospitality-oriented, a little less medically-oriented? Did you get rid of the glass at the front window that the check-in clerk uses so that she greets you in a hospitality approach and not a, please sign in on the log, you know, we'll get back with you? Did you change your back office experience? When the MA comes out to room the patient, you know, how do they handle it? What has been their training? Did you put them in through any sensitivity training, any hospitality training? Everything just tends to say we're going to see lots of people, we're going to extend our hours that will answer our calls, and we're going to extend the visit encounter time, but they don't actually put training forth into that front staff, back staff that's going to interface with the patient. The doctor has in his his or her head, this is what I want to do. This is how I want to care for people. This is why I'm moving there. But I don't know that they always sit the staff down and ask them if this is what they want to deliver. And so that becomes, I think, the biggest potential failure point and why retentions aren't what they could be in some of the practices and they're fighting for to get new patients in when they could have just held on to the patients they already had. So then both for yourself and for other physicians you've spoken with and you know, what are kind of the keys to success? What have you seen be the commonalities among people that have successfully made the transition? I would say, speaking with other physicians in the field, it's definitely investing, having the physician invest their time in training their staff appropriately and having their staff understand the transition and that this is a service model and the person walking in the door is not a patient, but they are a patron, they are a client. I always say that every phone call we answer, even though we may, it may be something as simple as a medication refill, and you say, yes, of course, I can take care of that. It'll be done right away. We always finish the call with, is there anything else I could do for you today? And that's not something you hear when you go into a medical practice. You know, that's something you may hear at a luxury hotel. So I think just taking the time to put that fundamental training into the staff is what I've identified as successful concierge practices when I've talked to other physicians who are benefiting like I am from being at a max capacity, having the same retention over and over above 90, 95%. It's because we took the time to make sure the people that, that interface with the clientele at whatever level that is. Is it your lab draw tech? Is it a nurse? 
Is it a front desk staff? They all understand that this is now a service industry. And you have to train people. It's not intuitive just because the doctor wants to transition. It's not intuitive that the staff knows how to make that transition. So I think that is a big key to success. Yeah, I think the parallel to hospitality is very apt. I've worked in the hospitality industry, and the people I've seen be successful there have an incredible feel of what I'm going to call user experience, and they can imagine and visualize on, you know, kinesthetically, visually, what is it like for this person to go through this experience of interacting with my business? What are, what are the feelings and the emotions that are going to be present when they're going through. And then they, you know, down to the slightest detail, like you said, at the end of the call, is there anything else I can help you with? I think if we could as a whole have maybe some more fundamental training to help the docs out that don't have a hospitality background or help them engage with training programs that could bring hospitality interfacing into their medical, I think it would be a big bonus to the community as a whole as well, just so they could learn some of those subtle traits that maybe come naturally to some of us. Others, they need to learn that experience, and it would make a big difference. Well, you mentioned a lot of subtle things you do already. Are there any key things that stand out in your practice, maybe that people mention about the way you design the experience that really stands out? I would say the uniqueness of not even... I use the word cookie cutter, but even in a small volume practice, maybe where you average concierge has three to 500, I think a lot of the systems in place tend to still be the systems in place, and each person's experience probably looks similar. In my practice, we really pride ourselves on complete uniqueness to each and every person. So that can be something as simple as knowing that, you know, Mr. John Smith prefers to be text messaged instead of emailed or called so that every communication is always sent via text. Maybe we have a different experience where we know someone has unique specialist needs. We try and custom match that person's, what they would view as their experience to just them and only them. So we'll have different profiles for each person set up that we know exactly how that person wants to be interfaced. And it will look different for each and every person. I think that is what kind of allows me to be what we call the high-touch approach. Very similar, we'll keep referencing hospitality, but very similar to somebody who comes in and wants to stay in the penthouse suite. You're going to know what their favorite foods are. You're going to know, you know, how they like their amenities set up. You're going to know what show they want to go to. We do the exact same thing. We, we profile the person. We keep a written profile so any person in Consulari who interfaces with them knows that this is their unique way that they want to be handled. And then we make sure we do it that way. Is there a specific tool you use to keep profiles of your patients? Um, outside of the fact that we use Macs in our practice, so we're using contacts and we're using notes in those that communicate across all the different computers, no. I mean, I, I don't have any type of an IT software that, that does that. I think that would be a great concept. The good news is because we're very small, most of us know the profiles in our heads, but we do keep generalized notes and anyone can reference on how a contact experience should go with someone. But developing that as you would develop it for probably other service industries would be a great opportunity in concierge as well. Well, one thing you might look at, and I've heard other physicians say, is they've adapted customer relationship management software, like what a sales team would use. Oh, yeah, that's a great idea. And use that to keep profiles on their patients. So obviously it's not going to be perfect since it's designed for sales teams and not for concierge physicians, but similar use cases in that they need to understand exactly how those experiences look and really keep details. No, I think it's a great idea. And probably if the industry grew enough in the world of concierge and more physicians understood how that customer experience can really complement their their retention and their recruitment of patients, you know, it might even be something that an IT company would look at expanding on. Well, tell us a bit more about then what you see the concierge movement in general going, and maybe as a part of that, how you think it'll shape up in terms of, I know there's a broad spectrum, so you're on one end of the spectrum with this very high touch, more premium service, and then there are other doctors that are 
on the other end of the spectrum, like you said, that might have 600 or even 800 patients for one physician. What do you think that's going to look like? Is the distribution going to be about the same uh, in five years, or do you think it'll move one way or the other? Well, I think with the dynamic changes that everyone is experiencing in the U.S. with affordable care and the changing dynamic of of your experience with your long-term physician no longer maybe being available, many of the high-volume insurance-based practices going to using extenders and not physicians, I think the opportunity is ripe for anyone who wants to migrate into the private pay sector, be it concierge or direct primary care, which are two distinctly different models, but both serve, potentially serve the same population. I think now is the time to move in that, to establish yourself and to explore that as an opportunity. People are searching in all economic classes. They are searching for a different experience. And I can't use that word enough because it's really what we're talking about. We're not talking about checking into a minute clinic and having someone look down your throat and say yes or no, it's strep. They're talking about having a confidant that they can go back to the old times of sharing their most personal questions and needs, feeling like they have somebody who genuinely buys into their health care goals, keeping them as healthy as possible within their own particular space. So I think that if you're even talking to the family of four that has a combined income of 100 or 125,000, it's not unobtainable for that person to pay $100 a month per adult and X amount per child to have that experience as long as you deliver that experience. So I think it's the best time ever. It certainly was a lot harder six years ago when I moved into this space because we were suffering from an economic downturn. It was the worst time that you could think about launching this. Now you have people asking Joe on the street, is there something else I can do? I'm willing to put some of my personal funds forward to protect my most valuable asset, which is my health and my family's health. And I know that in the traditional system, no one's watching out for me, so I need to watch out for me. So I I would encourage people to look at the vast majority of cash-based models, retainer, fee-for-service, direct primary care, see which one fits your needs, which price point do you want to come in, how many consumers do you want to be able to reach out to and help, Certainly, if you want to have 600 people in your practice, you're going to have a very different design than I'm going to have, but it doesn't mean that it has to be any less fulfilling, and it doesn't mean that you're in a different market space, because I think we all share that space. It's just different people will gravitate to different needs. Well, if you were speaking to someone then that's sold on the idea you're talking about, this is the direction they want to move, what is the kind of one piece of advice you would give to them if you could only say one thing? I would say go shadow somebody doing it first. Be careful where you leap until you really know what you're getting into. And certainly making the decision because you feel like it's a monetary decision or it's a lifestyle decision that you're going to work less, maybe see fewer people, it's going to be an easier road, I think that would be setting you up for failure. So go find somebody in your community that's already doing it, that's open arms to say, hey, you want to look at doing this? Come on, let me show you what a typical day looks like. Experience that day or go to a meeting, go to a national meeting, invest the weekend to be around people that do this for a living so you can get a feel and a flavor. But do it because you're looking for a different experience with the consumer. Don't do it because you think it's a shorter work day or a different lifestyle. Most of my friends that are concierge, And most of my friends that are in high volume, regular traditional medicine, you know, we work longer hours. We're not necessarily throwing that out there to sound like a complaint. The truth of the matter is, is we don't see as many people, but we're 24-7 on call and that does come into play. We take very few vacations because our clients really want to make sure that they see us and not someone else. So from that standpoint, you're going to give up some personal space. And be willing to do that before you leap into it because, of course, it can be a big financial disaster if you aren't doing it for the right reasons. Well, Dr. Marinka, thank you very much. That was very helpful, and it's been a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Absolutely. And if people want to get in touch with you, what's the best way for them to do that? 
I'm very readily available. My number is posted all over the Internet. So you can just go to my website from my company at consolarimd.com or Google my name, Dr. Carrie Bordenko. It comes up fairly easy. And then that number listed everywhere is actually my direct cell number. So feel free to reach out. I answer it 24-7. Well, thank you very much. We'll put a link to your website up on the post when this show goes live so everyone can find you there. Great. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you. You too. Hey guys, this is your host, Taylor Pearson. To give you a little background on the show, after seeing my dad and sister, both physicians, struggle to find a good resource for how to transition from their traditional practices, I launched Concierge Medicine Radio to create a resource to help physicians and healthcare professionals launch, run, and grow patient-centered direct pay or concierge practices. If you enjoy the show and want to help us spread the word to other physicians and healthcare professionals, it really helps us out if you'll leave a review on iTunes. I know the iTunes interface is a little clunky to say the least, so we put together a quick guide on how you can leave us a review at conciergemedicineradio.com slash review, or you can go to conciergemedicineradio.com and click spread the word. Thanks for joining us today at Concierge Medicine Radio. If you found today's show valuable, we'd love it if you spread the word by leaving us a review on iTunes or sharing it with your friends. To see notes on today's show, please visit us at conciergemedicineradio.com. While you're there, leave us your email to hear about all upcoming episodes.